every one of them was nothing short of miraculous. Mm. Just to think about it, there was no person and all of a sudden there is. And it, it never ceased to to be old. You know, I think the main um, mistake of our civilization is that we treat the arrival of a new human being, kind of take it for granted and um, do it well, one more, one mm. more. But mm. it, the reality of it is that there is nothing short of miraculous in popping out of non-existence into this particular three-dimensional reality. Uh, I even saw the statistics that something like one to 400 trillion, the probability of any one of us to be born. Why don't we start, Elena, with, um, why don't you tell us a birth story that comes to mind? Maybe just a really, really unusual or uh, not even necessarily unusual, but some couple or some uh, woman who gave birth, maybe you were a part of their care, or it's a story that you heard that really illustrates how you view the entire birthing process. Well, um, have you seen my movie, Birth as We Know It? I have, yeah. yeah. So what I'm showing there is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction, of course, of what was happening in Russia in the 80s and 90s, because very few women wanted to have camera um, in their birth and specifically, you know, to be broadcasted all over the world. So most of the uh, births were very private and there was no extra people at all. But some of the births at the Black Sea, where it was just a shallow lagoon and all of the Russian birthing Olympic team <laughs> was there to, um, to, to welcome new beings on, on this planet earth every one of them was nothing short of miraculous mm. just to think about it there was no person and all of a sudden there is and it, it never ceased to to be old you know i think the main um mistake of our civilization is that we treat the arrival of a new human being Kind of take it for granted and um, do it well one more one mm. more but mm. it, the reality of it is that there is nothing short of miraculous in popping out of non-existence into this particular three-dimensional reality uh, i even saw the statistics that something like one to four hundred trillion the probability of any one of us to be born. Mm. It's uh, the, the whole process from, from the very first moment of creation to delivering a fully full-term baby with two arms, two legs, and two eyes. <laughs> there are so many places where something can go wrong. Mm. When it doesn't, when we actually come out and 
we are able to walk this earth. It's just fantastic because just think about it. The vaginal mucus is toxic to the sperm. Mm -hmm. Find that tiny, tiny opening at the end of the vagina that is the size of two sperm heads. How is he poor little thing supposed to find it in the dark, you know, without any <laughs> map? How is he going to find the egg, which is there only two days out of the month? It's really, um, there is just unexplainable, unexplainable process of even moving towards conception. When he finally gets her and she's there, how is he supposed to get in? Her membrane is the most impenetrable wall in this three-dimensional reality. It's really, right. um, he doesn't really have energy to storm that bastion. And yet, she opens up and welcomes him in and starts dividing. And that is exactly where the mystery begins. Yeah. Uh, what exactly is making her open to him and start dividing? Mm. We know what it looks like, you know, anatomically speaking, at every stage of the process. We know what it looks like. But the driving force behind it, that's the greatest mystery that we know nothing about it uh, unless we start inviting some metaphysical, um, you know, multi-dimensional um, terms and operations because none of it just physiologically makes sense. It shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, looking at it three-dimensionally, there shouldn't be any of us here. And yet, look at us. We're a total success story by the time we're born. <laughs> so, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree yeah. more. Yeah. So taking it further, a group of us um, decided that giving birth in the conventional birth house in Russia was not really appropriate because of all the barbaric practices that were upgraded to the status of norm and were just imposed on women. Um, it, I don't want to get into it. It's pretty graphic and pretty horrible. So at some point there was this notion that um, it needs to happen as, as natural as possible. And I was one of three people organizing those birth camps at the Black Sea. And that's where the most uh, unnameable beauty <laughs> of birth um, presented itself and was revealed. It's it's really there is no words to describe it when a woman just um, feels like it's imminent and she goes into this um, mystical state of of some parallel altered state mm. and then the baby is out in the water in this shallow lagoon uh, with wild dolphins jumping around. <laughs> And sometimes it happened at night and um, you can't really see anything unless it's full moon. Actually, most of them were happening at night. Um, Why do you think that is? Do you have any conjecture? Um, I think when it's totally quiet, when the woman is quiet, when all the noise, the static, uh, the intensity of the daily activity, everything quiets down and then the baby is just uh, able to be more um, aware of the ripeness that happened inside. Right. Because yeah. as we know, the, it's the baby who gives a signal of readiness. And it's very important to actually have g give a chance to the baby to communicate. Like, mama, I'm ready. And then the mother's body would respond with a full array of hormones and all the chemistry that is necessary to flood her bloodstream with enormous amount of oxytocin and everything that she needs to okay. open up the cervix and and override the bad habit of uh, adrenaline and all the 
the stress hormones in her bloodstream that is really just a bad habit that yeah. we uh, automatically uh, inherited from our foremothers. Yeah. Because yeah. it's been thousands of years that we are not really giving birth the way nature intended us to give birth, the way any cat can give birth. We are, um, we are equipped to produce enough uh, of that hormonal cocktail yeah. that would allow us to give birth in dignity, gracefully, with like with n knowing the full power of creation. Yeah. The power that created, that conceived that baby and carried it through the nine months of gestation, it's yeah. definitely able to get that baby out because yeah. um, whatever powers brought us into existence in the first place, they didn't just, oops, forgot that part. Yeah. Oops. How are they supposed to procreate? Oh, we would need uh, sharp metal objects for that. Nature yeah. is not that dumb. Yeah. It's not that stupid. It really embedded it, the, the, the mechanism of procreation, like any species knows how to procreate. So are we. And it, it's really important to claim that right, the, to claim that power because I'm watching all the drama unfolding with uh, disaster areas, with uh, shortages of power, with uh, roads being blocked. What are the pregnant women that are due, supposed to do when all help breaks loose? When nobody around knows what to do when she goes into labor other than call 911 and rush to the hospital with the uh, the operation room and all the specialists. What if we don't have access to that? Yeah. Um, it's really, really important for us to be able to claim that skill, like with everything else, like claim the skill of eating right to our body type, of moving uh, in accordance to the needs of the body, right. um, resting and, and living in peace in our hearts and minds that these are all the ingredients that we're bound to master this lifetime or another and i'd say the sooner the better what's there to wait for completely and in a sense it's a, a, a big task to bring ourselves into that kind of state of of um of empowerment but then I think that it's a lot bigger task to live without it. Yeah, totally agree. So going back to, um, you know, the, <laughs> your question, gosh, the, the so many births that were absolutely fantastic, but there is like nothing to, to talk about it. It's just this moment of, of surrender and focus, mm. re relaxed focus that is necessary to really stay, uh, that to maintain that quality of presence for a few hours to really know how to move, how to not move, how to sound, how when to go in the water, when to not be in the water, because there there is a balance and a dance. Because sometimes in the water, a woman gets so relaxed that everything just she just falls asleep and the baby falls asleep. So if she falls asleep, it's fine. <laughs> that happened many times when the baby is coming out, and that would wake her up from that deep altered state. But we need not to let the baby fall asleep. Sure, sure. So, um, I can add, I can add a little bit to that because you're, you're describing, um, my wife and I, we had a home birth, our second baby, they were both unmedicated undisturbed births, but we had a home birth, our second, and it was the most unfruitful story. It doesn't make a good story because people are used to watching Hollywood films. Her waters opened up around uh, 5 PM. Our friend who's a breath work facilitator came over and we got into some deep breathing 
The portal opened. Baby Everly Rosa came out, was asleep on her chest. The portal closed. All of the, we had a midwife. There was a doctor who's apprenticing in home birth. I also attend home births, just so you know. Um, but there was a doctor locally who was attending and she was a friend of mine. So she joined. There was a midwife student there. They just sat in the corner and watched. It, like, it, it was almost like, why didn't you call us sooner? But the baby was like coming out whenever they came up into the room. And an hour and 46 minutes after her waters opened, our baby was in this world, was completely asleep as if ha she had never been disturbed from that amniotic universe. That's not the type of birth story that people talk about. But that exactly. is exactly the type of story that I think we we should honor the most. Look at how beautiful this experience was. Look how, how much closure there was, how much healing came to my wife through this experience. And... um. And that's just it. An hour and 46. N not that everybody should have that or could have that, but that was her story. And there was it was so unremarkable that it was probably the most beautiful birth I've ever been to after thousands, you know, attending thousands of births. Yeah, the thing is that uh, why I called um, birth in agony a bad habit is because I heard the research that by the time a woman is giving birth, she's normally exposed to over a hundred scenes of terrifying suffering in birth, in the movies, in her sex ed classes, stories from aunties and girlfriends. And we are, for good or, <laughs> or bad, um, a highly suggestible creatures. So, uh, story after story if they are not nice to us our body hears them and it thinks that that's what yeah. is expected and that's the thing that the body has a mind of its own and that's where like working with birth trauma gets tricky because um the, our brain you know it's more complex than i will name right now but just for our purposes for this conversation to sort things out we have the thinking brain the cortex right that uh, neocortex too um the the one that governs our memory and um uh, thinking process uh our mental activity then there is reptilian brain over here on the top of the spinal cord that governs our physiology and then there is limbic brain in between it's like a chamber of uh, right. uh, different uh, kind of um, clusters of neurons mm -hmm. that's our emotional brain mm. and they are functioning um, due to our um, cognitive dissonance through the birth through school through high school they're functioning in competition with each other they need to be functioning in cooperation as a team that's why we have you know the thinking part when we decide to do something the physiology the physiology is there to back us up and make it happen and emotional component is there to support us to find our people you know our team our our village so we can actually enjoy the process of getting things accomplished but Normally, when we are not learning that state of being in cooperation, state of being in alignment, attunement, if you wish, they are kind of competing. Like, I think I want something, but my emotion is wired somehow that it's not a good thing. Mm. Like, for example, I know that it's not good for me to eat products with white flour or with chocolate mm -hmm. but i'm still doing it because i want it and my body tongue is craving it or when somebody wants to um get pregnant but their physiology like they want it with the mental power and with the heart power they they want that baby but their physiology is still terrified from the experience of being born if it wasn't um, a beautiful blissful experience or the worst case scenario if it was c-section because 
uh, then a little girl that is being born completely skips that part. Amazingly enough, that simple fact that a woman learns about giving birth by being born, that's that's fundamental, primal right. schooling that every woman needs to have. In C-section, it's missing because she was basically drugged and did not participate in that most significant process of being born because the the baby's body needs to produce a chain of um, chemicals and hormones to like uh, exit out of mother's belly. It's really as much a baby's job as the mother's job. And that process of getting out of there really activates so many mechanisms in that little body. It activates her um, zest for life. It activates her um, respiratory system, nervous system, digestive system. It like everything there is is being activated while she is making her way out of the mother's body. So mm. this section just deletes, cancels all the activation, and then the baby is like, "Where the heck am I?" What just happened? <laughs> like completely disoriented and and just doesn't doesn't understand what what are we doing now? You yeah. know, how do we digest the food? Mm. How do we really stay healthy in mm. all of us? Because the, the 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 switches are still off in the brain. So what what I'm driving into that sometimes the physiology overrides the desire to have a child that is in a woman's heart and in her mind so that that terror of birth will not allow her to conceive because that trauma is just sitting there like an elephant in the living room and not going anywhere and vice versa it could be that she um, decided that she doesn't want to have a child, that she decides to, you know, do something else in life and get get a good education, get a career and just, you know, make a difference in this world. And boom, the next thing she knows, she gets pregnant. Because uh, I know that millions of women would just nod at this moment because um, there is um, active sabotage going like this internal uh game that the, they in constant power struggle who is gonna take the upper hand who is gonna mm -hmm. um drive the and that's that's the thing if there is um unmet needs either in cortex or limbic or reptilian brain they start acting like tyrannical child mm. Fight for, you know, no, it's my needs are going to be met. No, it's my needs to be met. <laughs> it's, it, it just, either one of them can easily um, just in split second go into a severe temper tantrum. Yeah. And just bring chaos in a woman's life because, uh, because there was a fundamental piece missing that she needs to be in alignment within herself and coming into that alignment basically um, any healing modality that addresses all the parts of the brain with the same intensity at the same time that will do because if you're only addressing um, cortex through talk therapy and you just discuss things you can discuss the same things for 20 years but just because it's only activating cortex and the bulk of the trauma happened before cortex was even right. formed right. right you can't really shift the the energy running pattern in the body because you can understand it well you can understand how to justify all the you know, weak 
spots, but then you're not able to actually do anything because the mental part is not backed up by the the cell memory of trauma. See, that's the thing that limbic brain holds the memory of that trauma on a cellular level. And from what I understand, it works through the, the mechanism of just basic property of water to be able to retain memory. Because as babies, we are 99% water, you know? <laughs> yeah, and the research into water in memory of water is quite fascinating yeah. it's it's on the yeah. it's on the edge you know right now but man yes a lot to it yeah there's still uh, a lot of research about it and us being those little sea sausages you know just being the, the all that liquid with the membrane of the skin uh, we are fully um we're fully obeying that law of retaining the memory so whatever is happening throughout the nine months of gestation and then during birth and then uh, the postpartum period which is uh, i don't put a number of years onto that post post, post birth um, period because it depends on um, environment on the parenting style um, on personal properties of the brain of the human being, because um, to my understanding that automatic uh, coding, the imprinting of the nervous system is happening until it, the human being or an animal, actually, it, it translates to any animal that has a limbic system. So it happens until they acquire a sense of self. And that can happen with some people at the, at the age of two, with some people at the age of 10, with some people it will never actually happen. There is a lot of people walking around on autopilot on that programming and conditioning they received, and they never ran into a circumstance that would activate their own identity like beyond that conditioning, beyond the original programming. Yeah. So um, so it's just little little people that became old, but never um, became wise. Because wisdom is the, the function of the limbic brain. It's our inner elder that um, is capable of becoming wiser, not just more clever or um, more educated uh, uh, or intelligent in a like bookworm style. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is very important too, but just knowledge without wisdom is, um, is <laughs> able to take us in a lot of trouble um, and unfulfilled. Um, of uh, unrealized potential of our soul's agenda you know <laughs> i am also operating with uh, with um, from soul and spirit yeah. uh, i am not religious but i i call the soul which is the heart is the organ of soul our divine feminine our ability to relate to others to ourselves in a loving kindness um, relate to the world in the loving kindness it, it's the place where the limbic imprinting is happening and if it's negative then it overrides our ability to bring forth our inner elder the wise one because there is this trauma sitting right in the middle of it and it's very important to to neutralize that trauma because the soul is the connective tissue between the physiology and our spirit, which is our divine masculine, which is our um, cortex and neocortex. It's yeah. our ability to 
uh, be driven by by purpose, uh, their ability to set up goals and figuring out how to achieve our goals. It's this action um, um, aspect of us, while um, our feminine is the quality of being, mm -hmm. the, the our cortex and, and spirit on the different dimension is the, the quality of doing. And the two needs to be backed up by our physiology, our capacity to actually get up in the morning and have energy to to go do something because that is also where it can be a weak spot. You know, I have all these ideas and desires and and I wish to do something, but I just can't get out of bed. So let me put a little a little breaks on. Um, just to catch people up, I, I want to go back to the actual moment of birth. If there's some disturbance or there's not a full, um, let's not, I don't want to use the word acknowledgement. Let's say that if you are not, if you do not complete this rite of passage of childbirth as a birthing woman, the baby can actually um, be traumatized to, you know, I, I know that that word is used a lot, but let's just use it for this purpose. The woman may also experience some undigestible or undigested kernel. That's kind of through the lens of German new medicine. This profound initiation has not been completed and therefore it plays itself out later in life for this woman who maybe wants to get pregnant again and for this child throughout their life, which is all the more reason for us to step back and to support this as a sacred rite of passage, not as a medical procedure. Starting there, anybody out there, I think, who is struggling to conceive or who does perhaps have some identifiable birth trauma, um, and you know, I, I think it, it's, it's important to emphasize that even if you had an unmedicated or whatever type of birth, a lot of women come out of their natural births usually in the hospital, and they say something still didn't feel right. And now we're on that metaphysical and the energetics level where women um, are not given the opportunity to tell their story and to perhaps digest some of this, this pro, you know, or process through some of these things that happened, whether it was how they were touched, how they were spoken to, and just not being seen or heard in this incredibly, remarkably um, spiritual opportunity, which is childbirth. So when a couples go to, I mentioned my friend Jared Picard, who has a, a beautiful company, Be Here Farm and Nature. He's not going to care that I mentioned your name. In fact, he actually told me to say hi, knowing that I was interviewing you today. He and his wife, Elisa, they went through um, some of your trainings or maybe a workshop with you where you actually helped work through some past traumas that may have been impacting their ability to conceive. So this was five, six years ago, preconception. Now they have a beautiful six-year-old. Kaya, um, hi Kaya. Perhaps you can maybe walk through. I, you know, you probably don't remember exactly what you did with them, but I don't think that's relevant. Maybe you can sort of describe what is your approach to this, because this is very, very hard to go to your doctor or even your your therapist or whatever. A lot of very, very good professionals in some things are not really good at this whole trauma conversation. So maybe you can help to unpack that. What do these exercises look like? What does conscious conception even mean? Uh, let me outline the the scope of trauma because the when we say birth trauma, people usually think it's a C-section or circumcision. It's like the the two big ones. But the thing is, uh, when we start going like zooming into that, turns out that the the fetus is being traumatized inside of mother's belly when parents are arguing. That's go figure. It's like, now we have to deal with that. It turns out that the biggest impact on the quality of gestation that will impact the quality of birth is the mother's emotional state. So it's basically from the moment of conception, including the moment of conception, because somehow it translates into the rest of the story. So it's not just during birth, it's 
basically from the moment a woman said yes to have that baby. So um, the, the quality of interaction of future parents, then it, of course, you know, if there was toxic behaviors or lifestyle habits, that is also extremely traumatic because then the baby is saturated in the amniotic fluids, yeah. um, poisoned by by whatever parents are doing or not doing. And then when we come to the actual birth, it could be even just the bright lights in the delivery room, loud noises. Uh, the worst offender is that what we all had is premature cutting of the cord. Yeah. No natural process. The animal out there in the wild is born and somebody clips their uh, umbilical cord right away. So that vital mana, the blood, the, the oh, plasma yeah. is still mm -hmm. in the placenta and and clumping the cord right away is basically forcing the baby to take that first breath with lungs that are still collapsed after going through the birth canal and they're not ready to take that first breath. All you need to do is really to hold the baby gently, um, still attached to the placenta, hold face down with head down, uh, lower than hips, and let the fluids uh, come out because uh, that suction thing that they, they you know, shove oh, in the nostrils. The syringe thing, yeah. <laughs> that's, imagine so you're walking down the street and somebody comes to you and, and sticks that thing <laughs> into your nostril without, you know, communicating, asking permission, <laughs> and not very gently either. It just goes as hard and hard. Mm far as possible so all of those routine uh, abusive um, experiences that are not even considered trauma because there is no uh, cut there is no you know blood drawn it's still extremely uncomfortable that makes the baby go into this um, sensory overload and kind of check out, you know, that state of dissociation. That to dissociate, that's exactly right, yeah. Exactly, when when um, we encounter something like bigger than our nervous system can process, we just go into that flight, fight, or freeze mode, and that actually stops our most critical importance of, of getting acquainted with the new environment. That's when we learn at the neck breaking speed oh, the, all the new sensations, smells, sights, even though we can't really focus yet, everything is blurry, but it's very different than what we had inside the belly. And imagine if you're in the dark movie theater and you come out in this bright, sunshiny day, it's like, oh, that hurts the yeah, eyes, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and it's us who have like 100 times more dull the, the receptors because we had all our life of sensory overload for the eyes and ears and blah, blah, blah. Babies are maybe 100 times. It, it, the research varies greatly on that. But the infant is extremely sensitive because there is none of that dulling factor uh, the, entered the the world yet for that baby so anything anything that uh can really cause the baby to contract and dissociate right. and then there is the moment of inviting that baby to relax to start growing to latch on to to just start building the body you know now it's your job but for the baby to actually be able to do that they need to be able to come out of that frozen or fight flight response that is embedded it's like it's in there from the start so the only way to help the baby relax is by um very very gentle and skillful um communication the the touch the touch is the main thing actually the way we touch the baby softly gently lovingly 
the the mother's smile, the smell, the sound of her heartbeat, you know, that can bring the the baby out of that contracted state when 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 there is a message being delivered, it's safe to relax now. It's okay, sweetie. I'm so sorry. You know, I I startled you, but it's okay. I'm here. You're here. We love you. We welcome you. You know, yeah. all of that. And instead, we could be, you know, the skin might be rubbed to to wipe the the that terrible vernix and all of that oh, <laughs> horrible <laughs> stuff. Yeah. No, the the. The, the lights, the sounds, the loud voices, it, it, the needles. The needles, the needles vitamin K, bam, yeah, yeah. It's horrible. It's horrible. And um, don't get me started on circumcision. That is basically happening. But you're you're speaking to the right guy. I've already done uh, two interviews. George Ann Chapin of Intact America and Brendan Murata, filmmaker behind American Circumcision, have both been guests on the show. I am 100% on board if you wanted to go there because I think it actually is, it bears repeating if you'd like. It's my heart bleeds for all the little boys that lost that most important organ. It's it's a most important organ of pleasure. It's actually the main organ of pleasure in a man that is responsible for knowing where your sexual partner is in in relation in the sexual relationship uh, of the intercourse. So without it, the man is basically blindfolded. He doesn't have that um, electromagnetic uh, reader that, that that's the foreskin that is equipped with 20,000 of most precious erogenous nerve endings that are supposed to be able to deliver the the um, genitals communication with each other. So it's very, um, it's a highway robbery, really. It, it's. <laughs> yeah. Imagine, I mean, day one of life, what are we, what are we imprinting on a little boy? Well, by exactly. teaching him that if we can hold you down, we're bigger and stronger than you. We're going to hold you down and cut a piece of your body off. What are we imprinting on that little person? Talk about well, an, a dissociating yeah. experience. Yeah with excruciating pain because those erogenous nerve endings, there is nothing in the body as sensitive as they are. So the, the human body is not able to experience more pain than through that. Mm. And it's not mainly without anesthetics. And, and uh, you know, I, I would like to mention something. I uh, had a pleasure of meeting uh, a rabbi, Israeli rabbi, who was very scholarly. And I had two, well, he died. That's why I um, refer to him in the past tense. But he knew 23 dead languages. He was very, very deep in in knowing, like, the, the original wording. And I had two questions for him. One, can you tell me the exact wording about the demand of circumcision? How was it exactly explained why, why we need to do that? And my second question was the exact wording of the, and women should suffer in birth. That mm. piece that I was never able to, like, really? <laughs> why? So he actually got very curious about it. He he was a brilliant, very like present person. And he was like, really? That's I, I would like to know that. So he spent something like four months researching, trying to go, you know, to the earlier and earlier and earlier sources of those uh, two big, big issues. And he finally got back to me with the, he was more surprised than, well, I actually wasn't surprised because uh, I was, <laughs> I was expecting something like that. You know, things don't make sense. And my, that's my religion, common sense. You know, when things <laughs> don't make sense, I start questioning it. So he said that. My religion too. It sounds like we go to the same church. <laughs> <laughs> so the earliest uh, mention of circumcision was on those uh, tablets, early tablets, and yeah. it had 
one sentence only where the word um, uh, foreskin was mentioned. And it said, remove the foreskins from your heart. Mm. And then the rest was already translations, interpretations, interpretations of translations. It was just kind of layers and layers of later um, um, sources. But it was, he said, that's the only actual original um, place where I found the word foreskin related to remove the foreskins. It said, remove the foreskins from your heart. Wow. And then he went further um, uh, explaining about that uh, woman should suffer in birth. He said it's actually not the word suffer. It was the word that is more like equivalent of the word labor. Labor with, the, with their offsprings in terms that actually not like a cat give birth and walk away or most of the animals it was labor with your young ones it, it meant you actually supposed to take care of them and and raise them and stay with them and and you, you know teach them it was about um not leaving the the human babies alone basically it there was absolutely nothing even remotely close to the word suffering so mm. that was a big eye opening so yeah so let, so let's talk about the actual exercises like what would a person do if they had birth trauma what is the type of work that you do with them um do just because i want to make sure we get through two more questions before our time is up we've got about 20 minutes or so left doing a very good job keeping me on track i'm i you know i'm the i'm the sh the, the host of the show <laughs> Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, in in my discovery of what is it that has the power to prevent birth trauma in the delivery, mm -hmm. uh, the, there were a few answers. So one of them is that um, first things first, a woman needs to neutralize her own birth trauma. Because if she was not born well, her body literally does not know how to do that. So in order to neutralize her own birth trauma, we need to go into like this slightly altered state to find that switch in, in the nervous system and flip it on. That, that's basically what mm -hmm. we're doing. The mechanics of it, it's it, it's a proprietary blend of different um, <laughs> proprietary blend. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> different steps that involves breathing, movement, um, guided meditation. It, it's called uh, limbic imprint recoding uh, process that I I give in my training. That is like if I would just name something you would say oh it's like rebirthing no it's not like rebirthing oh it's like yoga no it's not like yoga it, it's kind of um many steps of of descending into that slightly altered state that results in in um access of of that place beyond the story before mm. that story of the imprinting begun. So basically going to the very beginning, maybe even before in into into that moment when the spirit decided to to walk this earth. You mm. know? Mm -hmm. And from that place unfolding um the whole story of choosing the parents, it's kind of um it's kind of writing an alternative story and that doesn't really cancel the existing story because you know everything you are is the result of of your journeys so you don't really want to cancel it but you want to create some kind of alternative route that can um you know if you are going from point a to point b is like 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 this and all of a sudden boom you yeah. can 
Yeah. That route still exists, and every once in a while it will raise its head. But the consistency of choosing the new route that is actually graceful and efficient, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a learned skill and it's a training. But first you need to create that of claiming your, your birthright of being in this empowered, aligned state. Mm. And it's very important not to do it as a mental construction because then it just remains a mental construction. This remains stuck up there in the uh, it, it's like I have a cerebral hair, cortex. But, yeah, yeah. But my body doesn't know how to adopt it, and that's the whole point that why we need to do it in the altered state is so that cellular memory could be reprogrammed, and um. And then it needs to be integrated. That's the, the the other very, very important part. It's not like, oh, we've done the process, we can go drive home. It needs to be integrated properly, which requires right. Right. touch, specific breath, and touch by, by a, a set of like five, six pairs of hands. Mm. Um, every part of the body. It's really an amazing experience when you go through hill because first in order to go into that place there is a, a bit of a catharsis because the, the only way out is in <laughs> you need to actually descend into that underworld that is you know mentioned in every mythology of every location every existing mythology has that deep journey into the underworld mm. to retrieve the beloved something that was lost so this That's is my uh, practice by the way beloved holistics i don't know if you knew that yeah i saw it uh, on your email yeah so there is that moment so you need to um by the way i don't use any psychedelics it, it's uh, um i i never had um, inclination for um, the the chemical altering the mental state. I think that um, breath and movement are quite sufficient. For that. Do, so, you, do you think though that the use of psychedelics could, for some people who are so stuck in the in the 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 sort of thinking their way out of the problem, do you think getting their mind out of it for some people yeah, that psychedelics I, may I be helpful? There is no blanket statement. There is enormous power in it for people who are ready for it and then there is enormous um um, um pitfall for people who are not really uh, ready for it and doing it as recreational drug. Sure. Sure. if it's done appropriately as a vision quest uh, as a as a response from the deep of the soul to to like i need some answers in that case, it's the most invaluable, important, uh, necessary tool that uh, don't even get you going in that direction. Yeah. And uh, but if it's just casually done, oh, I think I want to get high, then it's actually a bad thing. I totally <laughs> agree. I, I actually think there's no problem with recreating yourself, but using these as recreational drugs just to es it, it it sort of smacks of an escapism. Um, right. Many exactly. of the people that use these medicines, which I I am a huge proponent for the use of these medicines with the right set and setting. But exactly. if you're not going to do the integrative work, if you're not going in with the right intentions and you're treating this as a ceremony, it can get you into a lot of trouble. I mean, you can exactly. really- And yeah. it's going to be just another bad habit. But um, even though it brings some relief, it's not, um, it's not- working with issues it's just, just gives the capacity to cope with issues which is too big difference yeah. mm -hmm. it's sort of like putting a you know like um you've got uh, uh you know a nail in your foot and you just take a bunch of ibuprofen to take the pain away the nail is still in your foot we got to get that nail out <laughs> yeah which is the the, the largely a mean of uh, allopathic medicine let's just Absolutely. Not that place and um because we just don't know how to deal with it yeah 
So then going back to, this is just one out, out of the 40 processes I have in my birth into being method. So there is 40 very, very different processes and exercises uh, that combine kind of trying to leave no rocks unturned because it's not just the birth trauma that we need to neutralize. It could be uh, emotional trauma in early childhood. It could be sexual trauma at any given uh, time in woman's life um, that is uh, an epitome. I've been in the countries, I, I've taught in 58 countries in the last 25 years, and I've been in countries where it's 100% the, the rape of women starting very young age in Asia and Africa. Uh, and um, even statistics in California um, in the 90s, I don't know the recent, recent statistics, but in the 90s, it was three women out of five and one boy out of five. That's a national tragedy. <laughs> it's a crime against humanity because after the rape a woman if she is not able to find help neutralizing that experience the, the neutralizing the negative effects on her physiology on her emotional and mental state then she's going to carry that into the um, into the way she carries the way she conceives the way she attracts the future father of her baby it just carries through her entire being and uh, alters her choices. So all kinds of um, the, you know, there's medical, me mechanical, psychological, emotional, sexual reasons for possible complications in sure. conception, gestation and delivery. And then what kind of a mother, you know, she could be, giving birth beautifully but then somehow it, that's that's where her story ends you, you wouldn't believe how many women told me that oh the birth is not the end of the story they were so focused on preparing for conception and birth that somehow they skipped part that, oh, my gosh, oh yeah. there you have it you you had a baby now you have it 24 7 and that comes as a surprise it's like, mm. mm -hmm. did somebody tell me that it, it, it's uh, really important to bring this understanding and knowledge into as early of education as possible because my daughter who grew up with you know i dragged her to my classes to the conferences where i gave talks and she grew up when she was very little it was normal for her to see the, the birth that I show. And then when she was in seventh grade, she came home one day with, with square eyes and, and said, mom, they showed the video of birth and some of the girls in our class were just running out to the bathroom to puke. And she said, it was gross, it was horrible, it was terrible, we were crying. So I went to the teachers with my video and I said, I would like you to watch this and see if we can show them this to neutralize the trauma they received um, in the sex ed class. Wow. She did the due diligence and watched the movie and then gave it back to me. And she said, nobody would ever allow me to show this. They would tell me that I'm encouraging them to into being sexual, and the that is reason the most fucking crazy thing that any educator could ever possibly conceivably say. It's uh, those uh, most terrifying, bloody births are chosen, like they they chose them out of it. Most terrifying they are because somebody had a bright idea that it would stop the uh, the girls from having sex i mean that's that there is so much uh, there is so much that could be done in sex education class from let's say 7th grade that was probably my first sex education class and it was always about scaring you out of having sex because of STDs. They'd show you herpes ulcers on penises and syphilis. And they showed you a baby coming out as a shock and awe. There was never really a respectful conversation around consent 
or around fertility awareness or around the beauty of giving birth, telling right. a person how beautiful this is may even help them honor it. I don't want to get pregnant. I want to be, I want to find the the, the person who I'm energetically most, uh, I have this proclivity to create with. I mean, like it could be a completely different story and we are so far behind, I think. Exactly. And the main thing is uh, what needs to be taught is the deep sense of awe. Uh, yeah. The, awe. the greatest mystery that we were born, that we came into this world, and that there is a much bigger, right. um, bigger energy that brought us here. It's like that, that, um, that understanding that we didn't come here to just be bored and be dumb and be you know kind of <laughs> yeah <laughs> that there is something that behind that mystery that happened in spite of all the improbability of its happening that that we made this choice and decision to walk this earth and we did it and we're winners and that we have to like understand what brought us here well, speaking of of that, I have uh, one final question, and it's maybe the hardest one to answer. But where do babies come from? Um, well, that is the biggest question. Where do we come from? From my understanding, I understand. I I believe that there is that moment within the aeons of bliss when our spirit decides to have a different experience, you know, it's like, why, why we go try windsurfing or snowboarding or learn to fly an airplane is just because we kind of, at some point within this vast um, array of opportunities as that speck of consciousness, um, between realities we just make that impulse of oh i think i'm gonna just choose this particular beautiful little planet that gorgeous little speck like a pearl glowing in the vast darkness of of the universe and i'm gonna go see what it's like to be with confined in a form and then that intention of that speck of consciousness to acquire a form sets about to choose the time and space and, and parents. You know, this is my little mythology that kind of um, works for me. That's, you know, I looked at a lot of them in many different traditions and they kind of were not very satisfying or inviting. And, and, and I just decided that, you know what, I am just going to create God in my likeliness. I'm just going to create the one that cares and loves me and uh, wants me to be healthy and creative and sexual and, juicy and find the answers and the thing is my answers are as good as anybody else's mm -hmm. why don't i pick the ones that work for me and and this is what i came up with that there is that uh infinite curiosity that invites us to um to have that speck of time of confinement in the form because even if we live 200 years it is a tiny, tiny speck of time. Yeah. And why not try try something like that? And maybe there is some kind of pre-incarnational agreements and some kind of, um, see, the, the spirit has a drive, but the soul has an agenda. There is that, like, okay, let's mm. try, try that and that. And uh, when I went into those deep, vision quests, I came up with the, that answer that my soul's agenda was to teach love, to mm. learn uh, love, about love, and and bring 
that which is the most sacred and the most um, benevolent property of the that supreme intelligence that is behind all of that. Uh, and uh, it's not, again, it's not a religious uh, thing. I actually am from Russia, where there was no religion. There was communism as a religion. There was atheism as a state um, Im imposed, um, you know, way of explaining reality. Just three-dimensional Darwinian uh, model of the world. Yeah. yeah. So I was completely free of any notion or uh, imposed uh, ideas. So at some point, my life became a proof that there is something so much bigger than me that actually loves me, that actually cares deeply about me, that that mystical something that I can actually count on and communicate with. And, and um, it's my friend, it's... Uh, it's uh, something is very comforting. So I, I, you know, went from there. And um, my answer is that just because that, uh, because there are no accidents. If we are here, it's because we want it to be. Yeah. Because acquiring a form is incredibly complex, complicated process. And without that drive from this intention of the spirit to be manifested in form, it's just not going <laughs> to happen. <laughs> and, Love it. Yeah. Love it. That's maybe the best, one of, at least one of the best answers I've received to that question. And thank you. Uh, I want to give you some a compliment. I, I think that the way that you show up in the world, the embodiment that is Elena, is uh, one of the most um, integral embodiments that I've met. You know, a lot of us are trying to figure this out and we're using altered states of consciousness and we're using academics and we're doing all these things. What I love about you is it sort of kind of goes back to the sort of the pre-Christian times where you had the realists and then nomenclature and whatnot, post-Aristotle, we're talking like hundreds of years later, we started identifying and classifying the things around us. And it became this sort of reductive, materialistic way of viewing the world, which sort of dismissed the experience of, we can even say Christ consciousness, like I'm not a, I'm not a Christian, but the experience of Christ versus the description of Christ in a book. I mean, th these are these incredibly um, powerful paradigmatic shifts that we've seen over time. You are definitely somebody who has experienced this, which is probably why it is so uh, ineffable, so so hard to put language to what you do. And I just wanted to honor you and, and say thank you for this work. Um, and I want be people to be able to find you as well. So where would you like to direct people so that they can find your courses and of course your amazing film, which is only $17 guys. And it goes towards a great, um, a great <laughs> bigger story here of what Elena is putting into the rune, uh, in, into the world. So uh, please just tell people where they can find you and how they can reach out to, to uh, maybe learn more. My website is birthintobeing.com birthintobeing.com and um, the 74 minute documentary where I show 11 orgasmic births mm -hmm. is $17 but then the download of my favorite part it's 75 minutes when I play the movie again but I just sit with the mic and speak as fast as I can um, it's called director's commentary um, it's uh, it's a, 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 another um, download. I couldn't put them all in one wow. download because it's two separate 75 minute files. Um, and then there is bonus features that uh, everything else, the interviews that uh, didn't fit in, um, it's also another part. And then the Birth as we know it, the 74 minute feature film. It also has uh, what I call educational version of um, 40 minutes 
25 minutes, 10 minutes, three minutes, one minute. It's for different types of presentations using in classes and talks at the conferences. I don't charge any like screening fees, just, uh, you know, take one it time, on, show yeah. it to your students, to your clients. It speaks volumes by, by itself. You don't even you sit back and let me talk because um, it's so, uh, I can't even take credit for it. It just came on this one breath. It, I, it was making me as I was making it. It was just some magical um, download grounding that new birthing paradigm in this three dimensional reality. It's, it's, a uh, um, it surprises me every time I watch it <laughs> when I put it for my class, thinking that I will go do something else in that time while they're watching for an hour, I get stuck watching. It's so uh, just powerful and mesmerizing that it's like, wow, I can't believe <laughs> it's actually happening. But anyway, it's a beautiful film for those who haven't seen it. Um, and I just looked it up on the website. It is only $17. I mean, that is like a bottle of wine. Um, so treat yourself one night to uh, a screening of um, Elena's film. It's again, it's called Birth as We Know It. And um, I'm going to I'm going to rewatch. I'm going to purchase the director's commentary version because I haven't actually seen that version. So I will, um, we'll put all of the links in the show, Elena. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. And um, I, I, I just feel like we're kindred spirits. So I, I just feel so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.